All right, Friday, everyone. And as promised, the lecture today is, there's gonna be, I think, a lot of interesting information. Uh, it's not, we're not gonna have equations coming out of your ears, just like one simple equation. You don't even need to memorize it. And we're gonna talk about lasers and cell phones and all this kind of stuff. Now, one thing to note about the, and we're gonna be doing this for really about a week or two, uh, it's going to be, if, if all these equations weren't your thing, which is probably most of you, the converse is that I, I've got a lot of little facts, a lot of memorization type items to put on the test. So we're trading one type of heart for a different one. So just, just keep that in mind, all right? So uh, another hint I have is I've talked to some of you over break. One thing that you might want to consider to improve your scores is watching these more in the morning when you're a little bit more awake. I was reading that apparently your, your cognitive skills slow down by afternoon so much that some states are considering banning surgeries at times other than mornings because doctors do much worse if they're, if they're having to practice you know, later afternoon or evening. So I think it's fair to say that your mind kind of slows down a bit. So that's just a little, little hint that I wanted to, to drop on you if, if you're trying to improve your score, because you still have a decent amount of time to do it. Okay, anyway, all right, material at hand. I'll try to find a handout. You know, I don't, uh, I, I try to write things so that you write them at the same time and we keep pace. Uh, this, you know what, I'll just try to send you a handout on the electromagnetic spectrum. It's fair to say that a college graduate in the science discipline should know a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. I know like, oh, well, I know I see in the visible. I mean, that's what the word means. And you probably know that to lower energy is the infrared. That's where you get your night vision and higher energy are like UV and X-ray. I bet you know that. But what are the relevant energies? I mean, how much lower is infrared? Uh, what's lower in energy than infrared, right? Um, I can imagine if I really wanted to, you know, question, or, you know, are you basically competent, I would ask you, is radio a photon? And of course it is, right? I bet a lot of people would actually get that wrong. So what I've done is I've written the entire electromagnetic spectrum in two different sets of units. And I'm going to show you what they break down into in terms of their relative frequency range, what they're good for why they exist, and then we're going to talk about all the instrumentations we use to study or make the same. And again, a lot of detail, but I, I hope you find this kind of interesting because, especially with cell phones and telecommunications, mobile devices being so important, that all of this becomes very relevant, especially the part where, you know, that makes you see. Uh, so, at very low energy, and I'm going to use uh, units of electron volts, which hopefully you're kind of used to now. Electron volts are much better than length. We, in chemistry, we use wavelength. Now, in your UV vis spectra, like, like you've been using since high school or PCHEM lab, you know that a UV vis spectra is represented in nanometers. So we, we tend to use wavelength in chemistry. That's not really the smartest thing. It's not smart at all. <laughs> Physicists use electron volts. Electron volts is proportional to energy. Wavelength is not proportional to energy. And you'll see that on the scale. Anyway, I'm just pointing that out. It's a little dumb that we use wavelength, but I'm gonna put that up here anyway. Okay, at the lowest energy possible are, you know, very, very low EV, but in meters, meters, a thousand meters to one meter, okay. So what good is that? Well, more towards the one meter area is where we, we transmit radio signals and we have two different types, FM, AM, frequency modulation, uh, amplitude modulation. So those, are, those just represent how the electronics inside your radios uh, discern the signal. Now, the thing that's kind of interesting about this is you may notice that like, okay, radio telescopes, radio antennas, I know that these are, you know, these aren't like what they used to be, which used to be, like TV antennas used to be on top of homes, and they were, you know, about a meter, a meter tall, about, you know, about up to here. Did you notice that the size of the antenna 
and the size of the photon are about the same? Right, they have to be. How could you detect a one meter wavelength photon radio or TV if your antenna was not the same size, right? Remember how you have to have, uh, you can't make really low energy light from a light bulb because the light doesn't fit? Well, it's the same principle going on here. Now, I think cell phones are a little bit to the left of here. Now, another interesting thing about all this is especially, this is our telecommunications range. The interesting thing is, is that I haven't written any type of molecular process because there is none. So by molecular process, and I've written several, several here, is, is what would naturally absorb radiation at those wavelengths. At these wavelengths, there's nothing. So they go through buildings, they go through mountains. Not, not necessarily well, but, but they do do it. So this is why we communicate with each other and why your cell phone still works in this building even if we don't have a transponder in here. Now, the government tightly regulates this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you were to like build your own radio station, probably within an hour you're gonna be in prison for a fairly long time, by the way. They take this stuff really freaking seriously. It's, it's like kind of disturbing. I don't know why, but they do. The government has control over the electromagnetic spectrum and they license it out and sometimes sell it. And you've been hearing about some of this for 5G communications uh, lately. So just another little interesting fact about the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, next comes radio, uh, microwaves. So you notice I've written uh, wavelength, uh, sorry, 10 to the minus 3. Uh, I've written wavelength in a micro micrometer, so my, uh, microwaves, right? Their original term was radar waves, and so of course that's how radar works for like police scanners and whatnot. In fact, the first microwave ovens were called radar ranges, and so you can uh, YouTube those. You can see like 1960s type advertisements, and in, in the first things were called radar ranges. So anyway, a little historical context, and now we're going to have things absorb this radiation just because they can. And this is molecular rotations. Now your, your microwave oven is set to the frequency of water rotation. So what it's doing is causing water to rotate faster and faster inside the oven, which heats up your food. So that's the idea. Um, this is not going to be, from here on out, you're not going to want telecommunic telecommunications to work at these ranges because the, um, it, the, the electromagnetic radiation, radiation is just simply not going to go too far because molecules are going to start absorbing it. God forbid if you hit water, it's not your, your, you know, your little you know, speed scanner is not going to go very far at all. So, next is infrared, but there's this little interesting in-between between rotations and infrared, which are vibrations, and you, you're doing quite a bit in PCHEM lab with these. I think you're doing the acetylene lab, or maybe the HCL lab, it's definitely one or the other. In between is a little is a little industry in the physical sciences studying what's called terahertz radiation. Now, I'm not going to I won't hold your your feet to the fire on this. It's just like this is like a thing that people are studying more and more in, in physical chemistry, where we can make light at these in between infrared and microwave radiations. These are uh, the uh, photons at these frequencies are absorbed. And they're absorbed by things called librations. And these, these are pretty strange things. I don't think they're really well defined. Now what happens is imagine you have, let's say you're doing uh, infrared study on, uh, sorry, terahertz on water. What can happen is water molecules, maybe they kind of pair up and move together. Maybe there's like, you know, like hydrogen bonding, right? So, so they're hydrogen bonding and they're like moving together. Maybe they're like, kind of like trapped by some other water molecules and they're kind of moving back and forth. So, so that would be like a libration. Um, another example would be like phonons in a solid. So these are motions that involve many things moving together in some kind of collective way. So anyway, if any of you go into, the, you know, there's usually one or two students go into grad school and usually maybe one goes into PCHEM, so anyway, this is a thing. Infrared, of course, this is most interesting to you from infrared goggles, and I can tell you that I'm always getting um, some like emails from the DOE or the DOD saying, 
We want improved technologies for infrared infrared vision uh, because kind of like kind of like radio, you can kind of see through walls, right? You can see the heat go through walls. Now it's not great, but it does work to some degree. Um, I don't think we're going to be working with with radio goggles because they would be meter big, right? So you can see that infrared, which is a uh, ten to the minus six. Um, a meter, so one micrometer. So that's that is um, God. What is that? That is about one tenth of your ability to see, or one one hundredth, one one hundredth your eyes resolution. So it's it's pretty small, and so that's why you can make glasses. The glasses are normal sized, and of course, this is um, what what is responsible for infrared. What absorbs infrared light is is bonds, right? Bonds going from ground state to excited state. Uh, things that are hot may have excited state vibrations that then relax and emit light, right? In, emit infrared light, and that's what the goggles are meant for. So what the DoD and DOE are, they're always looking for is technology for um, like like the the sensor element in your camera, right? Just like a little chip, right? Right behind the lens. They want ones that can pick up infrared, but the ones we have have to be kept really, really cold because if the chip, you imagine that if the chip detects thermal stuff, but it itself is hot, it will detect itself, right? Which is crazy. It means that you don't get an image. So that's like one of the issues with thermal imaging is that the chips have to be kept really quite cold because otherwise they simply detect themselves and the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, they really want to find a way around that for, for obvious reasons, right? They don't want this chilly. Keeping things super cold is very expensive and hard to engineer. Uh, now, here's another little interesting fact. The infrared region of the spectrum has kind of a dead zone between, uh, so, so vibrations right now, the highest frequency vibration, I think, is H2. I think that's like the highest frequency vibration that exists. And I forgot what, we use wave numbers for this. It's like 4,000 wave numbers or something like that. I'll have to look that up. And then there's this kind of dead zone in the infrared. And that's why we want to build like goggles that work in this area. Um, there's no more vibrations that absorb when you get near the visible but the visible hasn't kicked in. And so the visible kicks in, this is 800 nanometers. You can't really quite see 800 nanometers. That's right outside your vision. I just kind of arbitrarily put this here. Uh, so at 800 nanometers, you're definitely, you're still a little in the infrared, and now you're in the single EV. And in the visible is when a new type of, if, if something's gonna absorb visible light, it's going to be electrons. Electrons like in a valence state, right? So think of those molecular orbitals I sent on benzene. Remember that benzene homework where you, where you had to use the 2D rigid rotor to do some calculations and I showed you some molecular orbitals for benzene? Those are the valence orbitals and if those absorb light, it would be, probably be in the visible to maybe UV. Okay, so electronic excitations where those electrons are in the highest energy states. And we're going, to, we're going to spend a whole lecture on that. That's coming up two lectures from now. Now, the visible is actually a really narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum in either, <laughs> uh, especially in, in units of length, which again are, are kind of dodgy. In units of EV, um, we're going from 10 to the minus 5 to 10,000, so this is like, you know, two. So the visible is, is surprisingly a very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum. But what's kind of interesting to me is once, excuse me, once you get past blue, of course your eyes don't work. And then now we're in the ultraviolet. Interesting things. This energy is where damage starts to occur. Uh, where the energy of photons are so great that the energy imparted to a molecule via absorbing it could damage the molecule. So it's kind of interesting to me that our eyes cut off at that area. Now there's also another reason for that is that the sun makes tons of UV and I think x-ray light, but we don't see any of it thanks to the ozone layer which we tried to destroy. <laughs> All right, the ozone layer, O3, 
absorbs these types of light, high energy light. And as a result, there's none of it for us to interact with, so maybe that's why we can't see it. But that's also good because it would also simultaneously kill us. And so when we were using refrigerants that destroyed the ozone layer, and we figured out that that was happening, people in South America and Patagonia, for, a, for like a few years, the ozone hole went over their area and they were getting cancer left and right. I mean, it was hideous. It was so bad, we meet, the entire world banned the use of uh, chlorofluorocarbons uh, because it, it was, it was going to kill us all. I mean, that was, that was really quite obvious. Okay, now, in the UV, it's still those valence-type electrons, but as you get to higher energy, then x-rays kick in. Of course, x-rays like the dentist and whatnot, a broken arm. Uh, then you can get up into the 10,000 EV, and that's about the limit of what humans can make on, on the planet, and that's as much as you would ever want to make. What we now, I'll talk a little bit more about this super high energy. Uh, the number one facility in the entire world to make high energy x-rays is 20 miles from here, Argonne National Lab, the advanced photon source where I spend quite a bit of time. And what this is good for is characterizing solid state materials. Why do we do that? Solid state materials are how we build electronics, uh, catalysts, solar cells. So a, a catalyst for like the oil industry. In fact, uh, what's kind of interesting is that if you go walk around the advanced photon source, you can take tours there, by the way, and, and you really ought to. It's, it's, a, it's a, I don't know about now, but um, it sucks, doesn't it? Uh, but if you ever do get a tour, I swear I think they filmed part of Star Trek in there, like, but like, like that's the inside of the, the starship is the advanced photon source. And the oil industry actually has a couple of beam stations there where they study catalysts for, for you know, oil transformation to, to make it work better, better gas or whatnot. And so studying solid state materials is a very large part of what we do to create a functioning society. So that's why we have this facility, and there's several others in the world. France, Japan has a similar ones. And then there's smaller versions of Argonne National Lab at other places, of several in the United States. Okay, I'm kind of droning on and on. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum, and I think it's kind of reasonable that you would have some idea of what it is, how it's ordered, how it works. Of course, I would probably put on a test have you order these? Um, it's again. I don't think that would really be asking too much because it kind of makes sense. Uh, now, what I want to talk about is now this is this is really kind of funny how much of a problem this is. But I just mentioned that there are uses for all these different lights. The low energy is where our TVs and radios and cell phones work, and at the higher energies is where we, we study solid state materials and again it's considered terribly important when we spent billions of dollars on these types of national labs to do this. So there isn't really any part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we don't we humans find useful. Now get this. Visible light is not too hard not too hard to make by light bulbs. Not that those are that great, right? We're switching to LEDs whatever. What about the rest of it? What about infrared? What about, how, how do they make the x-rays at Argonne? Get this, it's actually shockingly difficult. This has been and it's still a gigantic endeavor of humanity to build light sources at wavelengths other than visible. Now visible is incredibly easy to make, but nothing else is. And that it's like, it's just kind of damning in terms of like how much energy uh, we have put into making light bulbs at different wavelengths and the consequences of the fact that they really don't work that well and they're terribly in energy inefficient. And that's why, like I, yeah, I keep talking about Argonne, I, I just like working there. That place, is, that place uses up the electricity of an entire city just to make some x-rays. So, but we consider it important enough that we do it, so why? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through all the mechanisms by which we make light. So again, I thought you might find this kind of interesting. Now, as I mentioned, the visible. Of course, this is a light bulb. 
And you may recall that um, from our Planck distribution, which of course is going to be on the final exam, uh, you get this type of behavior where here's your visible. So your filament would be at like 55 uh, K, which is about the surface of the sun, which guess what makes it look white, produces white light like the sun does. So it's a good mimic, it works the same way. And um, so there you go. That's great for visible light. <laughs> now here's the, here's the thing. What about, you know, UV higher energy light? Yeah, no. Remember the Boltzmann part, the Boltzmann equation says that you have E, e to the minus energy, I know there's two E's, right? E to the minus energy probability of producing these higher energy photons. So it cuts off real quick. So that's no good for UV or higher. Now to the right, where we get to infrared, we get to, you know, IR right about here, it drops off. Now why is that? You may recall because the light bulb isn't that big. There's these mode numbers. The, the photons wavelength have to, has to fit in the bulb. And as you get to longer wavelength and, and lower energy, that becomes a bit of a problem until eventually you get the size of the light bulb itself, and now it's dead. So here's my point. For IR close to the visible, like 800 nanometers, I, I know it's put it up there, I probably should rethink really that. That's, that's still really in the infrared. Light bulbs can produce okay, you know, let's say like that's 800 nanometers. Um, so, um, so light bulbs do okay up into a point. And when it comes to lower energy in red, then that's a bit of a problem. And what we do then is try to, we will actually use more sophisticated uh, light bulbs, basically. So we, we re-engineer light bulbs to produce more and more infrared. Uh, and, and it's really, to be blunt, it's just not that efficient, but we haven't really thought of a better way to do this. So there's that. So a visible infrared, but crappy infrared, is, is this is our best technology. Okay. So that's all fine and good, and you know, look, light bulbs, I'm pretty sure, you know, you've heard of this. <laughs> we did it with Planck, so you got some equations that described it, but this is, this is an old thing, right? Uh, now what I'm going to do is going to tell you more, more of our technology, whether it be low or high energy, is, all right, so just forget this, it's based on... Accelerating electrons. Accelerating electrons, and actually that's kind of what's going on in a light bulb filament, by the way, is that the electrons, right, that stream through it, you know, they're, they're moving through that filament and bouncing off the metal that makes it hot. So we, we're always doing all this with electricity, right? That's our, like, really our only technology so far. Okay, now how do we use electricity to make like a radio transmitter work? And this would also include cell phones. Okay, now I'm gonna have to spend a little bit of time drawing some stuff. Now, those of you who were a little nerdy, which would be all of you, know that this symbol is, uh, if you were ever kind of into electronics, this is a symbol that means that this is like a voltage source that's variable, so it's um, alternating, so that's up and down. So let's say uh, we have a voltage source and here's a wire that goes up and the electrons at some moment are pointed up and that means that the other side has to be positive because it has to balance. Okay. Now what we have over here is an observer looking through a, a telescope uh, at, at this and has some measuring device. Now I can see here that, and again, I'm hoping I'm using the symbology correct about stuff I learned in second semester physics, which has <laughs> been a while, right? <laughs> but I think I'm still doing this right. So it's like a, uh, you know, a little arrow points towards the negative and a little positive is where it's positive. Okay, now our observer is asked to characterize what's seen and our observer says, well, I, I see the same thing. Okay. 
Now, here's the trick. Uh, now, the observer is, um, oh, hell, I'm going to have to do this. I know this is like looking weird, but I have to do this for reasons you'll see in a minute. Okay, our, our observer is 200 miles away. And why I'm doing that will make sense in a second. Okay, now, now here's the deal. Instantaneously, uh, well, not, nothing is instantaneous, including absorption of light. Quickly, the source switches direction. And just uses some electronics to do that. Let's just say it's really, really, really quick. Okay, so now this is pointed down. Okay, now you could imagine in that moment that this is switched. In the exact moment it happens, our observer sees the same thing. Not enough time has passed, right? I said instantaneous at the exact same time. This was pointed up, now it's pointed down, but zero seconds later, the observer still sees it pointed up. Because the speed of light, right? The, the photons that are telling this observer what's up haven't traveled yet. Okay, now, let me, let me, look, let me just double check this. Uh, yeah, one millisecond, one millisecond later, he asked the observer what's seen, and same thing. You know why? 200 miles divided by one millisecond is still faster than the speed of light. So, this is switched, but even one millisecond, the observer still doesn't know because photons haven't traveled there yet. You can't know anything such that that information travels faster than the speed of light. How would you transmit that information? <laughs> Electrons don't go faster than the speed of light. They have mass. They, 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 that's impossible. Light goes the speed of light, and that's the fastest thing there is. Okay. At 1.1 millisecond, guess what? The observer has seen the switch. Okay. So, I know this is maybe more appropriate for high school students, so what the heck am I talking about? Okay, now let's think about this. The, during the switching process, what I'm going to do is, uh, yeah, I, I talked about one observer, and here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to have the transmitter is going to be cycling between, you know, plus and minus. So cycling in time, um, you know, using whatever electronics they used to do that. You know, whenever I, you listen to the radio, I, I don't hear it so much now, but sometimes they're like, you know, serving the Chicago land with 5,000 watts of power, and what, what they're talking about is the electricity they're using to drive the, the tower. Okay, now, um, along the way are <laughs> pathetic stick figures. Um, along the way are now multiple observers. Now, so you can see why I gave you an idea of a single observer. And now we've got multiple people. And these are just citizens who are just standing around and, um, and what do they see? Okay. Now, uh, what would happen is each one of them at any given moment, as this is oscillating, this person might see a um, might see a change. Let's let's say their baseline is right here. This person might see relatively soon what's happening. This person not so much, and this person here would see that, and on and on and on. So because of the way it takes time to transmit this information, look at what, look at what they're seeing. I didn't do this super well, <laughs> it's actually awful, but what they're seeing is an electromagnetic wave, All right? What's that? That's an electromagnetic wave. What's an electromagnetic wave also, electromagnetic wave also known? It's known as a photon. So, by generating this electromagnetic wave, from cycling between positive and negative during in this, what is actually, guess what? A radio tower 
right? That's how they that's how they look. Uh, this radio tower, cycling, and it has a little light, by the way, so planes don't hit them. By sending electrons up and down and up and down and up and down at 5,000 watts and coming at you from the Chicago land, uh, it creates this time varying electromagnetic field, which is a photon essentially because of the way observers see this as a wave, which happens because of the speed of light. And, and yeah, so it creates a wave, and, and you can't have a wavy electromagnetic field. And, and a, you have to have, if you have that, you have to have a photon at the same time. So what you're doing are making radio photons. So that's how we send that information. Okay, next one. This next one is really cool. I think you're gonna like this a lot. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about another type of manipulation of electrons. We're gonna talk about a single electron that produces light. This is how we work with more high energy light. Uh, I think I need to wipe out the board, so I'll be right back. Okay, actually, I, I realize I spoke at a turn. Let me talk about one other type of low energy light, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the high energy light, and, and, and again, more manipulation of electrons. Um, so this is how you generate microwaves. This is called a magnetron. And has a magnetic, a strong magnetic field. It has, uh, it has a very strong permanent magnets in it. So if you ever find an old microwave and you tear it apart, you can get a hold of a really powerful magnet. Which, if you're in middle school like I once was, that's a lot of fun. Okay. Now what happens is, and my drawing here isn't great. Uh, what happens is that this is a vacuum. This cavity. This is a cavity, and it's a vacuum. But right in the middle is a little, and you're, you're looking like, you're looking, looking through it. Okay, but through this vacuum is a little rod, and it generates electrons. Okay, so that's like this dot right here. Okay, now the surrounding is like a metal body, and there's like these little, I'm trying to draw these like little uh, fins, right? So these parts right here. Okay, now what happens is, because electrons are coming out of this little pin, and you would do that just by putting the voltage really, really, really negative, so negative the electrons will just fall out of the, the little metal plate, a little lightning rod, essentially. What happens is electrons come out, and based on the magnetic field strength, they'll start rotating. Now remember, this what I'm drawing here is, is a vacuum. Right, so they go round and round and round because of the magnetic field. And they'll, they'll rotate at about 2.5 gigahertz, and you can use the speed of light to translate that to a wavelength, and it's in the microwave region. So this is how we generate microwave light. Now what happens is, as the electron spirals, you create alternating positive and negative, because how couldn't you, right? I mean, this, this thing is whizzing around, and there you go. So the fins, it's not really so much the electrons spinning around, it's those metal fins that get polarized, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, and it does it very, very quickly. Now, given the geometry and the fact that these, these things, they're about the size of my fist, right now, radio towers are much bigger than the size of my fist, right? Like, like for actual radio, you know, cell phone towers are still kind of big, uh, but the transmitting elements are a little bit smaller, but for actual radio, uh, those are way big, and of course this is because they use lower energy, longer wavelength radiation, so they have to be bigger. Now, as you make smaller photons, smaller wavelength photons, your device itself can also be smaller. So again, these are about the size of my fist, and the interiors are a little bit smaller, and the trick here is how fast the electron rotates, and you can then translate the frequency to a wavelength, and that wavelength is in the microwave. Okay, and that's called a magnetron, by the way. All right, now I'm into, I got a little out of order there. Here I'm going to tell you about, this, this, is, this is the coolest one I know. All right, so we're going to, so, so forget about this. I'm going, to, I'm going to now go off into more high energy. And, and I just get real excited about this one. Uh, we're going to look at a single, a single electron. And, okay, so here it is. All right, now. Field lines. I had to go look up some, you know, second semester physics on this. But of course, there's an electric field. 
And it turns out electric field lines, they point towards the negative part. So that's just some kind of convention, which sure, why not? There has to be some, some way of knowing what's forward and backward when it comes to everything, right? Some convention. Okay. Now, let me give you a little bit of a preview. Just like the radio transmitter would, you know, you can manipulate it such that it's creating a field that's going up and down as you look over time and space, space and time being the same thing, if you think about the speed of light. Uh, remember, the radio transmitter was actually making a wavy electric field, which is the same thing as a photon. You can't have that without a photon, therefore you have photons. What we're going to do with this electrons, we're going to do basically the same thing. Okay, but it's got to be moving. It's got to be moving in a very specific way. What you want to do is have it move and have these field lines wiggle. And again, if the electric field is wiggling, you have photons. That's the goal. Now, just like the, uh, the electrons in the radio tower were, were going up and down with some velocity, uh, that actually is not enough to make it work. Because now think about this. Um, theory of relativity, right? Uh, motion's relative. So if an electron is sitting still, then the field lines can't be wiggling, right? Because how could it? The field lines would look just like I drew it. This electron, I know it's silly, but this electron isn't moving, so the field lines are just these straight lines. So how can I make those, those things wave? Okay, of course, if it's moving, well, well now hold on. This thing actually is moving, right? Because we're on the Earth, the Earth is rotating, the Earth is rotating around the Sun, the Sun is rotating around, its, uh, around the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is rotating around its local galaxy cluster. So we're moving probably quite fast relative to someone else. However, Einstein says motion is relative, so velocity doesn't cut it. You can't just, you can't have this electron moving, an electron just moving, just moving on its own business does not produce light. It has to accelerate. Okay, now an accelerating electron, that can work. Think about the radio transmitter, up, down, up, down. See, it's being accelerated. If you change directions, you technically were accelerated. Slowing down is just a negative acceleration, right? Okay, so we have to accelerate the electron, and then we can manipulate the field lines. Okay, now I'm going to try to draw this. Let, let me let me do the best I can with this, and if I choke badly, I'll just do some computer animation. Uh, don't hold me to that. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how well I'm going to do drawing this or not. Oh, it bothers me. Those field lines stick out too far. So we're going to accelerate it this way. Okay, so now I'm going to redraw this. So it's accelerating now, um, and, and here's the deal. The electron, this inner sphere, is going to move with the electron, but these, the outer sphere won't because, because the speed of light. Because um, to observers out here, the field lines won't change, but to the observers closer to the electron, the field lines will change. Now that's because the observers close by, the speed of light uh, communicates to them very quickly that the field lines are in motion. To the observers out here, the speed of light is not fast enough and they observe the field lines as still being static. Uh, it'll probably make a lot more sense here. Let, let me just draw what I mean. Okay, so here is the electrons field lines, uh, the close by ones. And again, I, and I know this, I, I'm drawing this because I've measured it, because I was close to an, an accelerating electron, and I had some way of mapping the field lines. Okay, now, now the observers further away, um, this sphere and this sphere are still the same. Oh, that's not, God, it's such an awful sphere, isn't it? There we go, it's a little better. Okay, now, this circle and this circle are the same. Now, so the inner, inner circle has moved forward. The outer circle has not. So its field lines are still where they used to be. 
And again, I know that because I had observers out here, and those observers reported. I said to them, hey, hey, what's going on? They said, well, nothing's changed. And that's because they're so far away from the accelerating electron, they, they don't even know that it's accelerated yet. Okay, now the field line, now, now remember, th this is just, um, this is not how things really work, okay? It's, it's an exaggeration, right? Um, you know, you, you're going to have some kind of smooth connection in between. So let's connect the field lines, and let's do this in, the, in kind of a smooth way, right? Right, because um, because how else could it how else could it not not do that? Uh, so we see that forward and backward. It doesn't look like much is happening. Yeah, it's not the best drawing, but but there you go. Okay, now what I'm seeing here is I'm seeing in the direction that it's going, like around it around it, those field lines that surround it, like, like you know, like a two um, up, and, up and down from its direction of motion, there's waviness, right? So the, the, the electric field is waving. And that means that there's radiation coming up and down. Of course, it's coming this way and that way, too. So this thing is causing the electric, line, electric field to, to oscillate. And you can't have an oscillating electric field without photons. So this thing is using the power that is driving its acceleration, and it's in that energy that's being given to it is being shed in the form of photons, kind of you know, uh, in, in, in a direction that's like this. So if the electron is coming at you, it's accelerating at you, and the radiation is coming outward. Now it's not coming at you or behind because you see that these field lines are, are not actually affected. Okay, now let me, let me try to redraw that uh, in a way that's a little bit more accurate. Um, again, this is kind of ridiculous what I, just, what I just did. I just wanted to get the idea across. Really it will look kind of more like this. Maybe I'll see if I can find a computer description of of how this really looks. Uh, this is just, you know, obviously the best I could do. And um, so there you go. Oh, that one doesn't look so good. So so there you go. And uh, not like that. There we go. All right. So uh, yeah, this is how this is how the thing generates light. And uh, let me let me give you a little bit more information about this. Uh, okay, so uh, the electron is accelerating, so let's call that A, and it's a vector, so it's accelerating in the same direction I've drawn. And let me tell you a little bit more about how the light is directed outwards in such a way, you know, again, think of it, think of like like a tube a tube uh, so that, that encases the accelerating electron and the surface of the tube has light radi radiating out from it. Uh, okay, so, so that's just one representation you often see. The power out of this is, there's a little equation for this, and I'm not going to hark on this too much. There's just a couple of things that are kind of interesting that have meaning. And I will point those out. I, mean, I could put these on a test. I did last year, heads up on that. Okay, so one is that the power is proportional to the charge squared. Now, the, now, the reason that's meaningful is electric field is proportional to charge. Here, I'll write that down. Electric field is proportional to charge. Right now, Q is charge. You should know that. Now, intensity, which we think of as power, is proportional to the E field squared. Right? You, you should have had this in the e and at some point. I, I bet you forgot, because I, <laughs> I forgot. And so if Q to E field, E field squared to intensity, and intensity is power, you can see why power is proportional to the charge squared. So anyway, just saying. Okay, acceleration, we've talked about why that is. 
I've got E naught, permeativity of free space, this is based on Coulomb's law, and C, speed of light. Now, another little factoid, I think I already told you this. When you see the speed of light in an equation, the theory of relativity is kicking in. Now remember that the reason that you see these field lights, the, the, the electric field get wavy, is because observers see different things depending on how far away they are from the, from the motion, and they perceive different things because the speed of light doesn't allow further away people to know anything happened while the people up close do. And you've seen me do all those drawings. That is part of Einstein's theory of relativity. And that's why there's a C in it. Now, remember I told you that if you have h-bar in an equation, that is due to quantum mechanics. Okay. All right. Uh, we only have just two more things. I was going to tell you a little bit more uh, about higher energy and how this thing uh, kicks in. I think I have about five minutes left, so we're almost done. Now, again, folks, I hope this was kind of interesting. I mean, you know, big machines... Um, Night vision goggles, right? I hope, I hope you thought this was kind of neat. Just two more bits about higher energy forms of light and how do you make... Uh, well, we'll start with UV. And UV, you use a plasma. Uh, so you would have um, some kind of... Uh, all right, so you, you largely just have a bulb. It's got a gas in it, although it's really quite dilute. That very, very low pressure gas. And you generate a spark. And that spark ionizes everything. Now, in a ionized plasma, the atoms, whatever the gas is, uh, neon, you know, neon lights, the electrons and the nuclei have become separated. And they're just swirling around each other. So everything's ionized. Okay, so here's a nucleus without an electron, and here comes an electron. And what it does is it just whizzes around it. What happens when an electron changes direction? It experiences a, say, oh, sorry, there's no one here. It experiences an acceleration. What did we just talk about? It talked about accelerating electrons generating light. So there you go. So having this C of positive and negative charges cause them to be moving around each other, swirling around like mad, such that they generate very high energy light. Okay, next one. Okay, let's do x-ray. I'm going to show you two x-rays. So I'm going to show you two ways to generate x-rays. I see I only have a few minutes left. Um, so this is how x-rays are generated at the dentist's office. So these are not too intense. They won't turn you into the Hulk. And it's, it's kind of interesting how this one works. You actually have a regular filament. So light bulb, right? Okay. And current, blah, blah, blah. Now here is a metal target. Okay, so metal. And it's going to be very positively charged. So what happens is electrons, and this is in a vacuum, strike the metal. And what you do is you create such a voltage mismatch to be like, like kilovolt. Kilovolt such that the EVs, electron volts, ends up being like in the X-ray region. So again, you make the voltage so high that the electrons impact the metal and stop. They stop, which is a form of acceleration. And the energy to account for that stopping is released by x-rays via, via the, the mechanism I just kind of crudely drew up there. And um, so, so this is not super efficient, but you don't really want to blow your head off of x-rays at a dentist's office anyway, so that's actually okay. It's actually kind of amazing how well this works, and it's, it's relatively simple. Okay, last bit. Last bit is a synchrotron. Okay, now this is uh, the advanced photon source at Argonne, and again, there's another one in France, another one in Japan, that, that are really, really powerful. And then we have smaller ones at many Department of Energy facilities, and again, we use these for material science research. 
Now, the way this works is uh, our, the advanced photon source at Argon, it's a circle. And um, so there's an inner circle and an outer circle. Now, the inner circle's job is to generate electrons that then get slung around the outer circle. And it actually takes, I think, 35 bins. So you know how like circles, you know, circles are never really circles. They're just a bunch of a bunch of lines that hug the surface. So this inner area, I've never been allowed in there. They don't allow really anyone to go in there. Generates electrons and accelerates them, and then it gets slung to the outer part. And the outer part, if I recall, it is one half a mile. I'm speaking out of my rear end. I think it's about a half a mile. It takes about 20 minutes to walk. Yeah, about 20 minutes to walk from one end to the other. And, um, okay, so what happens here is uh, that when an electron is traveling a direction but then bends, and they do this with magnets, that's acceleration, right? Whenever you change direction, slow down, whatever, whenever your velocity changes, it has to be due to an acceleration. So that bend, the energy that causes the acceleration, energy conservation, creates a X-ray photon. So that's how it works. The other thing they do is kind of neat. So this is one way, this is called a bend. And then there's another thing called a wiggle. I like that. Anyway, so how that works is you have a series of magnets. And so this is kind of obvious, actually. And the electron um, is going, uh, these are going about the speed of light. Remember, you actually did that on homework. And of course, it's deflected by the magnetic field. And so it's going up and down. And of course, any, any type of modulation to velocity is an acceleration. So again, you see us accelerating the electron. It's moving so quickly with so much energy that the output is, is X-ray X -ray light. And uh, these occur at every place where the, the basically the path of the electrons takes a, takes a turn so that it can hug the outer wall of the facility. So there's 35 stations. Uh, I'm usually, what am I usually at? I'm usually right here. <laughs> and uh, the bio people that do crystal structure of the proteins are here. Um, then we have the oil people somewhere else, and they have another area where they just develop on the x-rays further and further. So anyway, it's an absolutely fascinating place to work, and I encourage you all to go to grad school. If you come to our department in grad school, uh, we typically have a couple of grad students who work at their full to part time and they may get jobs and work at the Department of Energy their entire life working at uh, facilities like this. It's not a bad life, right? So anyway, I've gone over. Um, again, very descriptive. I hope you had fun with this. Notice that I do have a ton of like little things to ask questions on. So uh, just think about that in, in terms of your studying. Uh, we have an extra hour coming up. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. Maybe work some problems. I haven't thought that far ahead. But please stick around for that. Remember, we're almost through this, and I hope you have some jobs lined up. Okay, I'll see you all in a little bit.